Number one, Matthew 21, Jesus told the elders and chief priests by what authority he did these things. False. 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 What did he, what did he tell them? He would give them, he'd tell them if they told him what authority. Yeah, if you, if you tell me what, what about the authority John the Baptist did, I'll tell you. And they, they wouldn't answer him. So he said, I'm not telling you either. <laughs> Number two, at this time, Jesus enjoyed the support of a multitude of people in and around Jerusalem. True. 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 Number three, Jesus concluded that it was lawful to pay tribute to Rome. True. 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 Number four, Jesus replied that the first great commandment of the law was the Sabbath commandment. False. What is it? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. You got it. Number five, Jesus put a stop to the Sadducees' questioning before he stopped the Pharisees. True. 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 They gave up, and here come the Pharisees trying again. They, you, you think about it, they, the Pharisees were bound to be more persistent than the Sadducees were. Number six, Jesus told his disciples to obey the authority of the scribes and Pharisees. True. 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 The lives of the Pharisees were better than their teachings. False. False. <laughs> According to Matthew, <laughs> Jesus said... <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so, and just back to number seven. The lives of the Pharisees were better than their teachings. It was false. Now, why was it false? They were hypocrites. Hypocrites, right? They, he said. In fact, he said, "Do what they tell you. Don't do what they do." Right. Remember? Number eight. According to Matthew, Jesus said that wars and rumors of wars were a sign of the end. True. False. He said, "You shall hear of wars and rumors and wars, but the end is not." Yet. not Yes. Okay. Number nine, the parable of the talents, the servant who saved his Lord's talent was called wicked. True. True. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, the goats were on the left hand. True. True. Oh, everybody gets that one. Yeah. I said last week that I would uh, start off this week by allowing some question time, so because I, I have very little doubt, that especially on the segment having to do with healing, uh, that there might have been any number of things. I hope that you wrote them down and didn't rely on remembering them this week to be able to answer them. Do any of you have any questions that were uh, holding fire from last week? No? Did I do that good a job? Yes, yes, we got one coming down here as soon as she gets herself back here. <laughs> the, uh, the lady that wanted him to heal her daughter, yeah. she had to persistently. Yes, she did. And finally ended up to just even as long as he could turn off the table and answer. Yes. And then, after that, he turned the heel to the daughter, but when the centurion came to him, he did an instrument. That is correct. Correct. It's confusing. Well, it's not. It shouldn't be confusing. Uh, it does, however, raise a question. Uh, because he makes a statement to the woman, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and the centurion was not one of those people. Now, can you immediately think of any conclusion as to why this may have been so? Diane? The servant could have been an Israelite, although that may not be the point either, yes? Yeah? Well, could, could it have been the way that they answered in the way they replied? Well, there, there's a fact in the woman, but the, but the centurion hadn't, you know, all he did, he just walked up to Jesus and said, would you come heal my servant? She said, yeah, I'll come. He said, wait a minute, you don't need to come. Just say the word. Now, Jesus responded before there was either persistence or anything else on his part, and he, he expounded upon the man's faith after the man said, you don't need to come, right? So you have to think then, okay, what was different? There is something very different. Maybe because the Romans were That was a, that's certainly a factor you have to consider. This man was a, a member of an occupying military force. There is a message involved in healing his servant, isn't there? Is that something to do with belief, that he believed? Well, there isn't any doubt about that, uh, that he did, but that woman up there did too. That belief and faith go together? Yeah. Yes, but she, see, the, the, the Syrophoenician woman also believed, and he turned her down. We know she believed because of the subsequent thing, but there is a big difference between them, the, 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 the centurion and this woman, which is so obvious you'll miss it. E.B.? Well, uh, it would be a better example, a more outstanding example of compassion to all by him healing uh, the enemy, uh, so to speak. Yeah, 
It was. And you see, it made a public point. The other one didn't. Now you think about that for a minute. Both of them were Gentiles. Both of them had faith. And I really think we have to conclude that the Jesus' response was not because the servant was an Israelite. Because he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't responding to the servant. He was responding to the centurion, right? So we've got to think in terms of his response. He, his response to two Gentiles. With the one of them, he wanted to make a point. With the other one, there was no point to be made. And so he was not going to heal her. And don't make any mistake about it. He wasn't going to. Larry? Well, at, just in passing here, it's, uh, with my background, it's, it's almost... Uh, make you cringe to think that in fact Christ demonstrated in a rather political way the fact that he was uh, and had power to heal and to forgive sin. Or not. Or not. Yeah. When, it, whenever he wanted to. Yeah. That kind of, that's kind of a mind blower to me. It, it, it's sobering to reflect on this. It is very sobering to reflect on this. Now we could argue that oh, Jesus knew the woman was going to persist and he 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 turned her down in order to get this response, but uh, that's that's kind of weak, really. Uh, you're you're kind of manufacturing your argument at that point, which you don't really need to do. The fact of the matter is, there were thousands, probably, of people that Jesus could have healed in his ministry that he did not. Fair enough. Could have done it and didn't. So the ones that he did heal become significant. The significance of the healing of the of the centurion's servant is that he was a, 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 an officer of an occupying army and a Gentile, and Jesus wanted to respond to such a person as an, as an example. When he was away and out of Israel, he adhered scrupulously to his approach that I'm not sent to the Gentiles. That's for later. I am sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His work was going to be solely to the house of Israel. Now, when he will say later to his disciples, the works that I do will you do also, and greater works than these will you do because I go to my Father. What does that say? You see, we would tend to think in terms of here, you can do the works that I do in terms of uh, healing, miracles, walking on water and raising the dead. But there's another side to this story. And one is that, that, in a comparative sense, the results of Jesus' ministry were minuscule. There were, how many people assembled in that upper room on the day of Pentecost? 120. 120. Now, there were more, probably more disciples than that, but I don't know that there were that many more disciples than that. We know that about 500 people saw him alive after his resurrection, but there couldn't have been that many more people who were in the, you know, as a part of the church or the, the disciples of Christ in that after a three and a half year ministry. The apostles baptized 3,000 people in one day. Wouldn't be surprised if that turned out to be close to seven times the number of people who had been baptized previously. Would be interesting, wouldn't it, wouldn't it if that happened to be the case? Uh, seven times as many. Now, was that a greater work than he had done. Certainly. Certainly it was. And you see, also, they were going to take the gospel not merely to the house of Judah, not only to the house of Israel, but to the world. And uh, this was a, a very important part of what Jesus was, of the points that Jesus was making, is that this is going to be a religion for all mankind, not a Jewish sect that is becoming established here. And that's a far bigger point than you can imagine at this stage of things. Okay, we answer that question? Next question. Colleen? Um, I think we kind of got sidetracked the last time when we were talking about the blind man that had been healed, and then there was a question came up and we kind of passed over it. Problem, that happens. Yes. Uh, your comment was, of course, that God did not make the man blind, mm -hmm. just so Christ could heal him. Now, we're talking about the man born blind. Yes, yeah. the man born blind, and... I would like to for us to explore that just a little bit more because I think there's a uh, there's something of an answer in it 
Yeah. Um, I I wouldn't want to say that I thought it was time and chance, but I that made him blind. But he said they had not seen him, mm-hmm. and his parents had not seen him. Well, that caused it. Yeah. And so I just would like for a little more discussion on. Okay, it is inescapable, isn't it, that that there is a causal link between sin and sickness and disease. I, I just don't, I can't find theologically a way around that. With Isaiah 53 and with uh, the illustration of him letting the, the man sick with the palsy down, him saying, son, your sins are forgiven you, creating the issue, and then making the point that what, what I'm doing here is showing that I have the power to forgive sins so that the causal link exists between sickness and sin. However, the assumption is on many people's part is that the the uh, the link is direct. In other words, I sin, I get sick. I break this law, this happens. That if I am ill, I have one doctrine will approach at it. I have broken a physical law is the reason why I am physically ill. And I have to be forgiven of this physical sin. Now, there's a, there's a curious anomaly in all of that because the truth is you can't break physical law. It is utterly impossible. What's a physical law? Gravity. Gravity. Would anybody like to demonstrate how it can be broken? <laughs> you, if you can only obey the law of gravity, you cannot break it. Uh, in the attempt to overcome it, you may get broken, uh, but that you can't break the law. Uh, there was a there was a fallacy that existed in that all along, but yet we know that children, babies, before they ever have a chance to have anything happen to them, or, you know, they, they they can be sick before they've had a chance to know good or evil or make a decision in their life. So it can't be because of their sin. And so, humanly speaking, we look for the simplistic solution and we say to ourselves, well, then it must have been the parents' sin. But, no, it could have been the grandparents' sin. But, no, it could have been great-grandparents. But on the other hand, maybe it was neither. Maybe it was some greedy uh, farmer who sprayed a certain kind of pesticide on his crops that was the causal element. And maybe it wasn't merely him. Maybe if the parents had fed the child a little bit differently, that he would have had his resistance would have been higher and he would not have fallen prey to this particular thing. Maybe it is a defective gene and that defect in the gene took place a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago or longer than that ago. That there are actually people who, even though that perhaps even without a defective gene as such, seem to be more subject to certain illnesses than other people do. Uh, You know, these things are really beyond us. You know, there's a theory, I forget the name of it now, but I was reading an article about it not long ago, uh, having to do with with chance and determinism and the cause and causal effects of many things, that the waving of a butterfly's wing in the Amazon could actually play a part in precisely where a thunderstorm with subsequent tornado appears in Texas. Because you see, every movement of the air affects something else that goes on somewhere in the world, and the effects of it all are cumulative. But they are totally unpredictable. Theoretically, since God knows every hair on the head of your head, you know, every, every hair you have, and has them all numbered and knows everything when you comb your hair precisely how far down that number went at that time, uh, well, then presumably he would be able to make that prediction but even there, the difficulty with some of those predictions are that a butterfly apparently has the choice of making a right turn or a left turn when it comes to a flower bed. And then its choice affects other choices, and the whole thing is utterly unpredictable. And while we can safely say that sin and, that sickness is in the world because of sin, there is absolutely, it's, it's, it's an exercise in folly to try to ever trace a, a direct link between a sickness or an ailment, or an anything, and sin. Therefore, the attempt to place blame, you see, because in a sense, what the disciples were doing was trying to place blame, or at least responsibility, right? 
and it's very difficult for us to to kind of to try to get ourselves away from this. You know, uh, we always want to pin responsibility or place blame. And Jesus' point is, he comes to this, hey, that sort of thing happens. You know, this happens in order that God's glory might be made manifest. I think people are sick in this world to give them a chance to overcome. Some of the greatest people who have ever walked on the face of this planet have been some of its most afflicted. You do know that, don't you? And that if no one on the planet were ever afflicted, if no one ever had to overcome adversity, uh, where would the character be? Where would the greatness be? Where would the accomplishment be? I remember one book, uh, there's a chapter, and it, uh, it was on, I think, getting things done or something. The chapter was producers in spite of everything. And it, it, it went down the line and told how many great people in the world exactly what they had had to overcome in order to be what they were. Do you suppose it's possible that God does did actually, let's put it this way, in the original creation, allow for the possibility of adversity. And we know that he allowed us to make choices, don't we? And in the process of making those choices, we are going to make wrong choices. And when we make wrong choices, we're going to fall into adversity. And then when we overcome that adversity, we become stronger. And sometimes the greater the adversity the greater the strength, and the greater the man, and the greater the woman. Did this make any sense? Uh, I gave a sermon a long time ago called Beyond Adversity. Uh, if you haven't listened to it, you might find it interesting to go back and dig it out of our catalog and, and listen to it, because it's, I just explore this concept of, of adversity and, and what it does with a person. So, here is someone whom, while God did not press a button to make him be born blind, that it was certainly within the pattern of things that he would be, and perhaps even knowably within the pattern that he should be in that place at that time. And that this man born blind might have even been brought by God to this place at this time, as opposed to having been somewhere else that the glory of God might be made manifest in. So there are so many, I mean, it's, it's like trying to predict when you put a fan up here in the front room and turn the blade on and drop some or put a little a whiff of smoke or a particle of dust into the fan, if you were able to trace that dust to predict where it would wind up in the back of the room. Theoretically, it's completely predictable if you knew everything there was to know. But practically, it's not. And I suspect that this may fall in that kind of same kind of category. And we have kind of wanted to feel that way. On, on this particular answer, but I think I hope it sounds interesting, or at least I did. I thought there were a couple of interesting points in there. Uh, are we through with that, or do you have a, yeah, something yeah. else on it? No. Anybody else have any, any questions? In life? Yes, sir. I would like to have this omnipotent of God. If God is so powerful, I hear so many times people asking a simple question. Yeah. Can God create a rock <laughs> which he will not be able to lift himself? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, this, this question has been asked and other questions like it. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. a meaningless question. I know, but it's, everybody comes in and says, so? And everybody says, well, that's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the same category as this. For the person listening on the tape, I put a box on, on the marker board, and inside that box I have written this phrase. You might put it on your notes. All statements in this box are false. Therefore, this statement is false, isn't it? It's inside the box. But if it is false, then a statement inside the box can be true. And that means this statement can be true, therefore, it is false, and you go right around the circle. <laughs> it's the same sort of a question, really, precisely. And it's the same sort of a, of, a, of a conundrum that was posed when someone was exploring the idea of time travel. Uh, that is the old idea that a man travels back in time and kills his father before he was conceived. What is the effect on history? Well, the, the, uh, the absurd question, as absurd as it is, serves to illustrate the fallacy of the idea that man can travel backwards through time. It's not possible. Man exists in the present. Man does not travel uh, in, in the future or travel in the past. He cannot travel in the future because the future does not exist. 
And in fact, the past does not exist. Neither the, neither the past nor the present exist, except in your mind, and mine, and other people. And the past be recorded. Oh, sure. But it, but the past no longer exists. The record of it exists. Wasn't this fun? <laughs> <laughs> the key to sanity, right here. The key to sanity? Yes. Yeah. Right here, right yeah. now. Right here, right now. Just don't lose track of it. This is, this is switching into a philosophical kind of thing. Yeah. Well, the, the self of conscious being human beings, if there are the same as God, we don't want to do it. Okay. That's where we come back to it. It is indeed true. That God has made a commitment, and it is very obvious in the scheme of things. One does not even need it. Let's say it's the Lord to figure it out. It's plain as day. He has made a commitment that man will be free. In other words, there are some limitations that God has placed upon himself. Put them upon him. But he put them upon himself. Now, when you consider the implications of the fact that man is free, that means that I had the choice of turning right or turning left at, when I was standing in front of this podium just now. Did God know which way I was going to turn? He didn't. Matter of fact, I didn't even know. I just did it. Now, I would say this. If an odds maker had been watching me for a while, he could have made a good bet. He could have said, darn it, when he's standing right there and he's making that kind of point, because he's right-handed, turns right 95% of the time. He can make money on that. But he didn't know. There's a big difference between things you can make money on and things you know, right? God does not know which way I'm going to turn if I stand in front of this because he has left it to me to decide he can know. How can he know? He can make me go one way. How does he do that? I don't know. Hmm? I will. That, that just removes the question one further away. How does he do it through the Holy Spirit? I don't know how he does it. I just know he can. You know, I know he can. God can turn a man's mind. He can actually influence decisions in a person's mind. I believe that he does. I've given illustrations, you know, of praying for people and having their mind turn. Now, God will do that. But because he is committed to your freedom, he will not keep it turned. He will show you what's right. He will nudge you in that direction. He can plant your feet in the right way, but he will not make you stay there. He will open a door in front of you and close another one. But he will not keep you from bad beating the other door down so you can go the wrong way. I could use a hundred illustrations of it, but the principle is freedom, liberty. That a man has the liberty to do what he wants to do. And if a man decides he wants to destroy himself, God will allow him to do it. That you probably don't have too much trouble with. But now we come to a man who wants to destroy someone else. God will also allow him to do that. This God that we're reading about here, Jesus, would allow him to do that. How, do you, how does that one play in at home? That's what we're living with every day. Oh, yeah. You bet. It's exactly what you're living with. It's exactly what who knows how many million people in Europe lived with when they were packed in boxcars and shipped off to Buchenwald, Auschwitz, Dachau. God didn't do a thing. You let it happen. Now this is the the consequence, if you will, of freedom. And it's it's a it's a tough one. It's something you have to have to kind of try to get your mind around. But it is it is fundamental to what we're doing. Now I will also have to toss into your 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 uh, package of things you think about in this. It is one thing to allow this type of thing to happen. When you can make a complete remedy of the consequences later, it is another thing to let it happen when you cannot. What am I saying? Huh? What am I saying, Diane? I'm saying God can resurrect. It is one thing for God to allow. This, this thing is in the paper today, this poor kid from University of Texas and went down to the border and was coming back at night and I guess kidnapped by some fools down there, some, some innocent fools, not worse than that, some demonic 
crazed individuals and taken out, tortured, and sacrificed in some demonic ritual so that they would be immune to bullets of the police. You know, this, this, is, this is beyond my capacity to deal with. But this isn't God's world. I mean, he's, not, he's not running things down here right now. Somebody else is running things. His name is Lucifer. Used to be. Now God calls him what he is, and that's an adversary. And we call him the devil. And uh, he influences an enormous amount of things that go on in this world. And God allows it to be so because he can at a later time, and will, at a later time, bring that boy back and give him his life. Yeah? But there are times, though, when God does intervene in the situation. Certainly. Certainly. There is no question about it. What is it, though, when he does not? What's involved in it? You know, there's something that you can depend on that not everybody can. There's a statement made by Paul in Romans 8. He said, all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Now, that scripture is as important for what it doesn't say as it is for what it does say. It does not say that all things that happen to a person who's called by God will be good. It says all things will work for good. They will work for good because God will make them work for good, but there's a proviso involved in that. Any guesses what it is? You've got to respond to it, right? You have got to respond to it, right? Uh, if you let it defeat you, if you let it whip you, it may not work for your good. Certainly not in the short term. In fact, sometimes it's almost impossible to see any good that could ever come out of it at all. But when you understand the long view that God is able and intends fully to raise these people from the dead again who have suffered in this way. I, I have less trouble in the way understanding someone who was killed than I do have someone who was, who was tortured horribly and allowed to endure terrible uh, suffering over a long period. That, that one's even tougher to deal with. And I don't pretend to understand all the implications of that except for us perhaps to learn right down to the core of our being the bitterness of what it is to live in a world without God and apart from God. Because that's what's really involved, you understand that, don't you? It isn't a question that you have done something bad enough to warrant what is happening to you. That's not the point. I think I made the point not long ago is that, 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 that these things don't happen to us because we deserve them. If we got what we deserve, we would all be dead. That's not the point at all. None of us is getting what we deserve. The point is, is, is really very different from that. The point is that Jesus Christ is not the ruler of this world now. And I think by the time he gets back here, we will be ready for him to be. That we will have had enough of doing it our way, doing it the way it's being done, the way things are going. You spoke? And it isn't that God wants people to hurt. It isn't that God wants people to suffer. Not at all. He doesn't want that at all. You see, that's what we want, it seems. Maybe not all of us, but enough of us. We basically uh, want to live in this world. You know, we want to live out our lives. We, we want to be free. We don't, you know, somebody says, well, why doesn't God make a man so he could not sin? Well, God made creatures that couldn't sin. They're called dogs, and cats, and sheep, oxen. They don't sin. But you see, in order to be able to sin or be able to be free, you have to be able to make decisions. And for a decision to mean anything, it's got to be able to be bad, right? Otherwise, you're not free. God has, has given to us, and this whole question of healing or not healing, of suffering and how we deal with suffering, is all embodied in. And the only way I ever in my life and I think, ever came to, came to come to grips with it at all is when I understood that it was God's intent to turn us into God. First time I heard that, I thought it was blasphemy because I did not understand understand what it meant. And then I read in C.S. Lewis the same statement precisely. He's not he's not a member of the Church of God. He's the Church of England. That what God is actually doing is making men into God. And Jesus starts making these state you know some statements like this, and they said, "Well, that you're blasphemy because you're making yourself out to be like God." And Jesus, he, Jesus said, "Well, haven't you read in your own song?" I said. You are gods? 
that man is destined to become God. And along the way toward becoming that, there are certain things that have got to be changed, certain lessons that have got to be learned, certain of them driven home, certain of them very painful lessons, some of them very frightening lessons, but it's all a part of it. And I think I started down the line to explain it in Romans 8, 28, that, that it is in the process of enduring and overcoming that character is built. And that as long as you try, and this is the key element, that if you try, if you're putting one foot ahead of the other and trying to do the right thing, God will make it work for good somewhere on that line, somewhere on the timeline. It may not be immediate. It depends in large measure upon just what he wants you to do. And the more important, perhaps, or the bigger or the stronger that thing you is he wants you to do, the more difficult time you'll have to go through. I recall Paul, you know, who said, that he had this infirmity, a thorn in the flesh, he called it, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. I have a clue what that could mean. Uh, some feel it may have been his weak eyesight. But, you know, would I, I, I can't see myself using the term a messenger of Satan sent to buffet. Buffet, you know, is almost, you know, to, to buffet a person is to slap him around, isn't it? A messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. And he said the reason why this happened was because of the abundance of the revelations given to him, which I presume means lest he become wise in his own eyes and wise in his own conceit, right? And that people, that, and, and this is something I've come to understand, I just came to understand this a long time ago, that the greater thing that God has in store for you, the greater task, the greater potential for greatness on your part, the more severe oftentimes, if not always, the trial between where you are now and the place you're going to be. And I've used the illustration that before every major opportunity I have ever been given by God, there has been some measure of trial that has preceded it that seems to be in many ways commensurate with it. It has become less so as years have gone by because I think as people get older, a lot of times uh, lessons of the past are cumulative. And you don't have to be beaten about the head and shoulders maybe as many times to get through your head, uh, you know, how little you really have to offer. Uh, and so consequently, the opportunity to service is not that critical like it might have been in a younger time or another time in your life. But uh, there is no doubt Paul is an illustration of it. And then I could, could tell stories, if I could keep the names out of them, that I have known down through the years, years in, you know, that I have been in, in the faith of how God has done that same sort of thing again and again with people whom he has used mightily. In some cases, it's to keep people <coughs> humble. In other times, it is to create something in them that was not there before. In other words, it does two things. Humility creates humility, and it creates greatness. And you cannot understand healing or the lack of it unless that principle is somewhere in your, in your consciousness somewhere in your spirit. E.B.? You just touched on something that I've done a lot of thinking about uh, concerning Paul. Mm -hmm. And I personally have a theory <laughs> that, that, uh, that Satan and this system has promulgated the, what you just mentioned there about, about the thorn possibly being his eyesight. And that would be destroying some of the credibility of God's forgiveness when God healed him of the blindness that he had. Mm -hmm. And I think that they, they're trying to have some hangover blame left on the God family for that. Perhaps so. You know, there, there are so many things that Paul could have told us he didn't. Yeah. Uh, I've often thought, you know, I've, I've taken me probably a hundred years of sitting and talking with Paul, and I'll finally get all my questions answered, and I'll be satisfied. Uh, I may not even have some of the questions anymore by the time I get to where I can talk to him. But uh, I don't think he intended to tell us anything more than what we read right there, you know. His point is, is, is clear and well taken, that because of the abundance of the revelations given to him, you know, lest he should become exalted in his own eyes, God allowed him to have a thorn in the, in the flesh, which is passed into our language, by the way, right from that spot, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. 
And uh, it would be a small thing, you know, for us to not to assume that in whatever small way we might be going to be used by God, we ourselves might have some small affliction or struggle of ourselves to overcome. Now, in the case of the messenger sent from Satan to buffet Paul, uh, I think that, and I think probably in most cases, the things that happen do not happen because God does anything. That brings us back to Colleen's question. You know, did God do it? No. He doesn't have to. The world will do plenty, you know, without God having to lift a finger. What happens is that the evil that is in the world is turned toward God's purpose by him. Who was it that, 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 that afflicted Job? Satan. Who gave permission for, Job, for him to afflict him? God. Who was responsible? Infinite, in, in the end, he's responsible for it all, right? But the instrumentality was not God. I think that's an important concept you can keep in your mind. God is not the instrumentality of doing bad things to people. But things happen in this world. Awful things happen. The question is, is, is it going to work for any value or any good, or is anything worthwhile going to come out of it for you, or is it just going to be tragedy, unrelieved, and purposeless and meaningless. In most cases, it's meaningless. It only becomes meaningful as God puts meaning into it through your life. Yeah? I had one other question uh, having to do with healing. Um, we are talking quite a bit about uh, the reasons that Christ healed and so forth. This is fine. But what about, looking at it another way, what about the people that are doing healing, like the disciples who could not cast out the demons, this kind of mm -hmm. thing, because of lack of faith or whatever? Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I sure could. Uh, see if I can find a scripture in particular that I want. Yeah, Matthew, let's see, no. Find a particular one in question. Yeah, Luke 10. That's what I want. Luke 10. Now, it's, you know, we all think in terms of sending out the 12 apostles, and we think of these spiritual giants, you know, as, um, in one category. But here, we have some other people who might be not so much spiritual giants, just maybe a little bit, you know, long and short of it. In Luke 10, he says, After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also, and sent them two, be two, two and two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. Therefore he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Now this is an affliction that we have always had, and I trust always will have, in, in God's church. A lot more to do than we'll ever have people to do it. Pray you, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And if you want to know something to pray about, there is no, nothing of any greater importance to the church right now than that scripture, I mean, than, 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 that, than that prayer. He says, go your ways. I send you forth as lambs among the wolves. Don't carry a purse, no money, no shoes, not even an extra pair. I mean, I, I presume you wear shoes. And salute no man by the way. In other words, don't, don't stop and tarry and dawdle on the roadside talking to people. Just get on down the road. In whatsoever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall return to you again. I haven't a clue what that meant. I presume the 70 did. That they, something happened. You know, they said, peace to this house. And if it wasn't the right place to be, they knew it somehow. And in the same house, he said, remain eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. It's okay for you to be supported by these people as you go on your way better be because they didn't take any money remember didn't even take an extra pair of shoes if they wore out shoes someone had to give them shoes don't go from house to house and that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with canvassing your neighborhood you know knocking on doors i mean i had a baptist pastor come by my house the other day rang doorbell on sabbath morning i went to the door and hello there and he handed me his card and they were surveying the neighborhood to see if they were Baptists, Lutherans, Mormons, or what have you there, because they were thinking about establishing a Bible. They were from the White House, and they were thinking about establishing a Bible study somewhere along 346 and wanted to know what I'd be interested in going. And I said, well, no, I've got my own things I have to go to. I'm a minister myself. He said, oh, maybe you could come along and help us with the Bible study. 
I said, well, yeah, I possibly could. I'd be glad to. And uh, I went on and, and I made the point that, uh, you know, along the way, I said, well, I, you know, I observe Saturday and not not, not uh, Sunday as the Sabbath. He said, well, that's fine. He said, then you would be free on Sunday morning to get together with us. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yeah, I would. <laughs> Uh, well, he hasn't invited me again yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, we will see. Well, we will see. But anyway, uh, this is not prohibiting that type of thing. You know, there are some people who say that Jehovah's Witnesses are violating the commandment, do not house to house. No, they're not. They're violating your your privacy. Uh, they may be annoying as all get out, uh, but they are not violating the Bible by knocking on your door and finding out and saying, here I am, here's the Bible, here's some literature. That's nothing wrong with doing that at all. In fact, at some time where we had a community church, I don't think there'd be a thing in the world wrong with us in a very polite way, uh, making the point of canvassing the neighborhood to let people know we were there and that we had a Bible study and that they'd be very welcome if we could. And he, you know, he, was, he basically took a step back from the door, which is non-threatening when I answered the door. And uh, uh, all he did was give me his card, didn't give me a, a tract or a pamphlet or anything, and just went and said, hey, we're interested in the neighborhood and, and we're in this part of the world and if you need any help, you give us a call and we're... You know, here to help. So this that's the principle. Anyway, he said, Whatsoever house a city you, you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Heal the sick that are therein, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, you know, that's an interesting statement. You can't do what these people were told to do, because you haven't been given this commission. But, I, you know, if you had had Jesus himself look you in the eye and say, Now, I want you to heal... All sick people that are brought to you, you think you're going to manage? Yeah, well, theoretically, he probably told them what they're supposed to say and how to do it. They've been around him for a while, too. But in the whatsoever city you enter, they don't receive you. Go your way into the streets and say, and say, even the very dust of your city, which cleaves to us, we wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. That's heavy duty. You know, more tolerable for Sodom. Sodom. Now he went on to talk about other things than that. Then, in verse 17, he said, The seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. He said to them, Oh, you're impressed with this. He says, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. You know, I've seen some big things in my time. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. However, in this, don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you. Don't get excited about this. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. What does that say to you? Yeah. Tell me something. Would you be excited if you'd healed somebody? Yeah. You know, would you be excited if you'd cast out two or three demons and if some blind man can now see and some lame man can now walk because you happen to be there and you touched him and boop, there he goes. Yeah. You know. Would you be happy? Yeah. Jesus said, Don't get excited about this. I saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. Rejoice in this, that your name is written in heaven. This is cause for greater rejoicing, mind you now. You know how you'd feel if you heal somebody. How do you feel about your name being written in heaven? You take that for granted, don't you? That's the ultimate. That's what right? I said, are you sure it's there? <laughs> <laughs> I know about mine. <laughs> it's written there. I got, my name is written there. And you know that too. But what's funny about it is we do take it for granted. It's a, it's a strange thing. But we, it, it, is, it, is a, it is a matter of, maybe in some ways it's a, a measure of our faith. The extent to which we are able to get excited by something happening which to Jesus is rather ordinary. Because all you've done when you heal somebody is, is, is repair a sick body. 
And to him, it may be, be a, a great deal more than beating out a fender on a car would be to, a, to an auto mechanic. I, I think it is more than that, but, but you see what I'm saying. Joyce? Well, wasn't he also admonishing them not to get proud? Exactly. Exactly. He was also admonishing them not to get their tail in the air, not to get too ambitious, not to get overly impressed with themselves. He said, if you want to be happy, be happy about the fact that your name is still written in heaven and uh, realize that the things that have happened to you on this trip happened because I made them happen. Right? It was a, it was a mild uh, rebuke, in a way. Yeah? Well, it does exorcism fits into this. Exorcism? Yeah. Exorcism is simply the matter of casting out demons. In other words, and, and, it, and it is a matter, frankly, not a matter of, of bell, book, and candle, but a matter of spiritual power and obedience on the part of a, of, a, of a demon to the authority of Jesus Christ. That's what exorcism really involves. And to one who is able to do it, to one who has that authority and that power, it requires nothing but the word. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out. However, you remember these were, these fellows did, in on one occasion, were trying to cast out demons in Jesus' name and said, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I adjure you. And the demon said, Jesus we know, Paul we know. Who are you? <laughs> and they, they, they liked it. They, they, they tore their clothes off and sent them out of the house naked. You know, just stripped them. Probably bleeding a little bit too when they went out of the house. So I would say that one needs to know that one has been given that kind of authority before one attempts that, right? <laughs> and uh, also, another side of that story, I may, may digress uh, for one moment here before we take a break. I would like to make one you know, point as well, that one needs to be extremely careful, more than I can ever tell you, about ever implying or assuming demon possession. There is such a thing as mental illness, not which is not involved demon possession at all. I have been in the ministry now for 26, 7 years. To my knowledge, I have never personally encountered a demon. Surprise anybody here? No. I haven't encountered one. I've encountered some, some people who weren't quite right in the head, but it was a physical thing. You know, They were just not right, that's all. They were not demon possessed because there is, I am convinced, a difference. Judging the stories of my fellow ministers who have encountered them, I'm quite well aware of the fact that there is a definite difference in a discernment. Apparently, I would conclude from my experience that that's not my calling. And it is not God's intent for me to have to deal with that, that particular side of things. Otherwise, I probably would have been steered in the way of some along the way. So, but, but one of the things that concerns me greatly is that people who are unsettled or who are mentally ill are also oftentimes very suggestible. And if you allow to come out in their hearing or in the hearing of their relatives or loved ones any suggestion this person might be demon-possessed, you are doing them a grave disservice because people then may assume that they are and the terror that that generates could lead one to symptoms because there's the funny thing about the human mind. I think you suggest to, a, to an ill person that they are demon-possessed and they will begin to act like they are. <coughs> Whereas in, in, in some cases, because of the terror and the fear, they may get that way. So I would say be very, very cautious about that. And in my opinion, unless it comes down to the place to where God says to me, and I know, and when that time comes, I know, I'll know. I won't have any question about it. I will know. And I will deal with it. But unless I come to that place, I'm going to assume the person I'm dealing with is mentally ill. And I will approach Jesus in, in prayer on that assumption. And I figure if he knows something about it, I don't know, he can take care of that too. But don't ever make that assumption, and don't ever let those words out of your mouth about a person, or especially to a person, unless you have been given some gift by God and are prepared to accept the full responsibility for it. Fair enough? Of course, in, in the, the Gospels, we, we, could, we could keep this class going until Feast of Tabernacles and still not be through discussing all of the questions that we have, but I'll continue on with some things that I wanted to, uh, to point out. And uh, if you have questions as we go along, please, please feel free. First of all, I want to look at a few things in Matthew. Chapter 9... 
and the end of the chapter is this fascinating statement. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad like sheep having no shepherd. And that's interesting because, you know, you've you got people and you've got, and like he just before says, there are synagogues everywhere, there are rabbis, and in Jerusalem there are priests, and yet the people are like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now I made a, a comment on that in the last hour a little bit about uh, some of the things that, uh, you know, that, that, that we have to look at. But there is nothing more difficult in the church than this particular scripture. Uh, not difficult to understand, but difficult as far as an ongoing problem. It seems that as people come along who are like shepherds and can, can work, then the number of people, the number of sheep increases proportionately, and there never is, uh, there never are enough people. You know, we started in Tyler 10 years ago, and during that period of time, we the phone ourselves, you know, and, and these people would call in. And I remember so many times the question is, how can we get a ministry, you know, and, and is there a church here? And, I, you know, it really was a, a, a tragic situation of people being scattered abroad like sheep with no shepherd. And... I, I said something which, which you almost, from our position, you, you struggle along and you kind of learn to live with, and we try hard ourselves to find ways of remedying that problem. I know at one of the recent ministerial conferences, the guys were just pleading with said, we need more ministers, we need more ministers, and I asked the question, what do you want us to do? Are they unqualified people? And this, there was this silence descended over the, the group, and I said, I said, what we need is not more ministers. We need more leaders. We need more people who are qualified to serve God's people. And that's what this is all about. And all I can say is that people need to pray. I mean, by people, you all qualify there. That God would send more laborers into his harvest. And that's the only place I know they're going to come from. He is going to have to find them. He's going to have to call them. He's going to have to recruit them. And we think in terms of let's start a college and let's uh, uh, try to hold seminars and, and Bible classes. And that's all fine. But unless or until the calling of God it gets involved in a person's life to do something, nothing's going to happen. Now, something uh, Bronson and I were talking about at, at dinner tonight I think is also very important. That we too often try, we think in terms of, we see this, is this, or we see this huge problem to be solved with all these multitudes of people who are scattered abroad like sheep having no shepherd, and we think in terms of tackling the whole problem, and it becomes defeating. You know, you have absolutely no way of grappling with the whole problem. And we were thinking about it a bit at, at dinner, and, and, and the point comes very clear. You can't really solve that problem. All a person can do, though, is they, they can do something about one person who is near them, who is around them. Uh, we were thinking at the talking in, time, in, in those terms of, of, of young people in school and the desperate chaos that many of their lives are in and the hopeless situation of youth in this country. And we just said, just, you can't do anything about the whole problem. <coughs> and the problem, one of the things we get into is we, we see that. And we realize the problem is insoluble and we pray, may God's kingdom come. And we forget that it is not difficult at all to make a big difference in one person's life, is it? I mean, you, one person, could, couldn't you? make a big difference in one person's life. So you have to think in terms, not of trying to solve the whole problem, but in trying to solve the problem, you know, just a problem, where you are, or one problem that you can come to grips with, or one thing that you can do. And if, if people would do that, it would be a big help. Uh, you know, there are lonely people in the church who need somebody to talk to. There are are people who need a way to get to church. There are people who are sick and need to be visited. There are, it just goes on and on and on. And people, can, you know, will come to us and say, well, is there anything I can do? And, and that's defeating. That's defeating. Uh, because I'm probably going to say, well, I, I, I don't know of any offhand. Uh, maybe what I should say is when somebody comes to me and says, is there anything I can do? Say, well, uh, yeah, you can do something. You can find something for you to do. Go make yourself some work because that's what really it has to be. Now, I have my job, and I know what I'm supposed to do, and I, I try to do it, but I don't know what you're supposed to do. And God's going to have to help you understand what you're supposed to do. But I do know for a fact that one person 
reaching out and touching the life of one other person can really make a difference. And we're not going to solve the world's problem. Uh, you try solving the world's problem and you just get defeated by the whole thing and wind up doing nothing. It's the way a lot of us, you know, attack our work day. <laughs> we see everything there is to be done. I, mean, I can't do everything, so why do anything? But at least, you know, you can do one thing. But this is something I, I just wanted to take a moment to, to comment on. We already uh, went ahead to look at Matthew uh, 10 to the charge. Well, no, this is the charge to the 12 uh, when Jesus sent them out. Now, this, this 10th chapter, I think, is very, very important because it gives you a lot of insight into Jesus himself. <coughs> Because here is a, a, uh, a lengthy discourse here upon, first of all, we had the Sermon on the Mount, and that gave us a lot of insight, didn't it? Now we have a discourse of a different type, made to different people with a little different responsibility. He gave them, and you know, their names are given here in the chapter, he gave them power over all manner of sicknesses and all manner of disease. He said, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, Freely you have received, freely give. Now, once again, he says, don't bother with gold, silver, or brass in your purses. No money, no scrip, no two coats, not, not two pair of shoes, and so on. You know, he, once again, this thing of making yourself totally dependent upon the people that you are serving, which is interesting that he sent them out this way. But and again, the saluting uh, the house, and if the house is worthy, you know, it, you go in there. If it's not, you don't. Now, he goes on to say, verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. So I want you to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. I'm afraid oftentimes we get that backwards. But beware of men. They will deliver you up into councils. They will whip you in their synagogues. You shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake and a testimony against them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you up, I don't want you sitting around or lying awake nights thinking about what you're going to say. It shall be given to you in that hour what you shall speak, because it is not going to be you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaks in you. Now that's, a, that's a, an interesting promise. Now this is made to the twelve. This is made to individuals who are specifically being sent into a dangerous situation. And, and it won't necessarily apply to you in an argument you get into with your relatives, you know, about some theological question or anything of that sort. This is about persecution and life or death situations. Nevertheless, the principle is here, and I think all of us should be aware of it because one never knows what kind of situation you're going to find yourself in in years to come uh, as things get a little more difficult. Revelation makes it very clear that that sort of thing is going to happen, and so does indeed the Olivet Prophecy. He says, the brother shall deliver up brother to death, the father the child. Children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. Now, do you feel uncomfortable that you are not really hated of all men right now? Don't feel like you feel kind of good about it, huh? <laughs> Should you feel uncomfortable about it? Diane? Maybe hated when we realized. <laughs> Maybe. What do you think about that? What is it you suppose that made them hated? Because really these were good old boys. I mean they I have very little doubt in my mind they were all nice people to know, wouldn't you think? There's no indication to the contrary. They weren't hated, were they, because they were ugly people, or acted ugly, of course not. They were hated for another reason. Now, they also had the authority and the power to cast out unclean spirits and to heal the sick, right? Who hates that? Logical question, who does? Pharisees. Huh? Pharisees. Yeah, or anyone who would be threatened by it, right? <coughs> Whoever would be threatened by it. Now, it's entirely possible that a Pharisee, a given Pharisee, would not be the least bit threatened by it, might rejoice in it, might declare that Jesus was indeed the Christ. He just happens to be a Pharisee. Do you suppose that there were no convert converts from the Pharisees? Sure there were. The point is, it's not just a Pharisee. It is someone in authority whose authority is threatened by what they were doing. Now, teaching 
Just the fact that you come along and teach some harebrained religion would not necessarily make you the enemy of other people, would it? But suppose that that harebrained religion that you were teaching was being believed by a lot of folks in the congregation. Or that they were beginning to ask you questions that you couldn't answer. Do you suppose that would create some animosity? Oh, yeah. The problem is that whenever what they taught, or what we teach, or what anyone who does God's will does, when it begins to pose a threat to other people, they begin to hate it. Now, there are a couple of lessons involved in this for you. One is that there will come a time when what you are poses a threat, and there's not a thing in the world you can do about it. I mean, what you stand for. But there is also something for you to think about, that there was a lot of period of time in Jesus' life when he grew in favor with God and man. They thought he was a terrific person. His life, what kind of a person he was, was a wonderful person to know, very likable and easy to get along with. And even when he began to teach and heal the sick and so forth, the multitudes thought he was great. They thought he was wonderful. It was only the people who were threatened by it. Now, it was his job to threaten them. In fact, he went out of his way to threaten them. He went out of his way to job them, to use the old southern expression. Should you do that? No. Uh -uh. You have no warrant, no commission to do that. Our commission is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them, and teach them to observe all things Jesus commanded us to do. It is not to go out provoking people. Now, do you suppose that you might be able to comprehend and maybe situations of conflict that have arisen between you and loved ones, relatives, and what have you in the past, where, without thinking about it, you posed a threat that you didn't have to pose? Sure. Yeah. Easily. So, this is where a lot of the difficulty that arises between sometimes husband and wife, where one's in the church and one's out, uh, the church begins to pose a threat to the status quo in the family. There's a lot a wife can do to minimize that threat, or a husband to minimize that threat, and to make it clear that that does not damage the relationship in the family at all. That if anything, it should strengthen the relationship in the family. There is therefore no threat, there is therefore no reason for that person to get up and leave. Now, like I said, there will be enough situations when what you are and what you must be to obey God will pose a threat to people without you doing it unnecessarily. So give a little thought to the threat factor in your relationship with people who don't believe the same thing you believe because there isn't any need for that threat. And uh, it's something for us all to give some thought to about making our points do we need to be as provocative as Jesus needed to be? He was making a point that he was commissioned by the Father to make. You need to be a little more careful about that and try to set a good example and to be easy to be entreated and easy to get along with and uh, don't provoke these problems as you go. Anyway, he continues to say, You shall be hated of all men. This is the twelve he's talking to now, mind you. For my name's sake. He that endures to the end shall be saved. When they persecute you in this city, get up and leave. Go to the next one. You shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Now that's fascinating. I, would you, if you had been one of them, have felt like you had the right to assume that in your lifetime the Son of Man would be coming back? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I would have assumed that if I had been one of them, but apparently that's not what he meant. But you, whoever you is, will not have finally done whatever it was they were do through all the cities of Israel until the Son of Man is come back. Now, the disciple is not above his master. The servant is not above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be like his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, aren't they going to call those people of his household the same sort of names? Oh, sure. Don't be afraid of them. There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. There is nothing hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, I want you to speak in the, in the light. What you hear in the ear, you preach it on the housetops. And don't be afraid of them that kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, a lot of people have questions about that because of our teaching regarding the immortality of the soul. Any of you have questions on it? No? Nobody here has any questions. I think we have it covered in literature. Larry?
Well, it does, does uh, at first blush lead you to believe that the, the soul and the body are two different things. Well, in a sense they are. In a sense they are. Uh, because the soul is life. You can have a body that is dead. Follow me? The body means, the word, the word for body, in fact, is, uh, is soma. Uh, anglicize it here. S-O-M-A. The word for soul is uh, P-S-U-C-H-E suche. They don't mean the same thing. This word means life. This word means body. And so he says, don't be afraid of those that can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. In other words, he is saying that, that there is a possibility that someone can take something from you and not get something else. Now, here, here's where semantics gets in and rears its ugly head, uh, and you can get involved in an argument if you're not careful. But what he is simply saying is, is, don't be afraid of people who can kill the body, but cannot take your life away from you. They cannot, you know, basically, you say, well, what do you mean, my body's dead, I don't have any life. Oh, yeah, you do. Your life is hid with Christ and God. It's permanent. You have it. It's yours because God's given it to you. You have eternal life. They can't take that. You'd better be afraid of him who can kill your body and your life. So that doesn't exist anymore either. That's all this, this means. It's not anything uh, uh, terribly complicated or hard to follow. And he continues with many other things. He says finally, or not finally, but further in verse 34, Think not that I am come to send peace upon earth. I am not come to send peace, but a sword. I am come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be though that they of his own household. Now that's, uh, that's disturbing, isn't it? I mean, it ought to be disturbing to think in these terms because he says, I have come to set people against. Now, what does he mean by that? How are we to understand? Does that mean that it's okay for you to antagonize your family members? No. Nobody thinks that. What does it mean? Bob? Well, uh, the way I see it, it means that some will be given the knowledge to be able to see and understand. And members of their household won't. Yeah. You know, I, this, this is an odd thing, but marriages have broken up when a man who was an alcoholic quit drinking. It's not at all uncommon for that to happen. A man quits drinking and his marriage comes, comes apart uh, because as he sobers up, he is not the man she was used to. Things change. So the situation can actually improve and things still go bad, right? So consequently, is it possible for you then to begin to live a better life, be a better husband or a better wife or a, a better person and live cleaner and more uprightly and really disturb the status quo in your home and your family? Oh, you bet it is. I mean, it is as normal as it can be. And consequently, Jesus said, I'm sorry, this, this type of thing is going to happen. It's a, it's a pity. Now, is it your fault? No, it's not your fault. It's just one of those things that takes place. Uh, and in one way, it's a witness oftentimes against those people who see what you're doing and for some reason hate you for it. I suppose there are people here who have experienced that very thing, to where you've, you've done the right thing and people in your own family and people whom you love and love you uh, have not understood and have come to the place to where they almost hate you for what it is that you've done. It's, a, it's hard for me to understand. And yet Jesus right here says that that is going to happen. Now, there's something very critical, though, that comes out of this. He said, He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. I would presume, from what I'm reading here, that it's possible for a man to love Christ and love his father more. I presume it is possible for a woman to love Christ and to love her husband more, and maybe to love her children more than she loves Christ. Would you assume that? 
Now I go on to say that he that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. That a person could be a Christian of sorts and yet have a particular cross to bear. This is a uh, just an expression. What what do you suppose that how how would that how would you translate that for someone? What would that mean to them? You know, whoever takes not his cross and follows me. Well, well, literally, I think it would be like a burden, and what I think specifically is that by following Jesus Christ's way, by observing the Sabbath day, the holy days, and uh, living the way God Christ would have you live would actually create problems, and that's a burden. In other words, if you live, if you try, you make the step to obey Christ and to follow him, you are going to encounter some crises in your life as a result of that. Is that not correct? And what you're saying is you're supposed to pick that up and carry it. And if you're not willing to pick that up and carry it, you can't be my disciple. Not, you're, in fact, no, putting it this way, he says, you're not worthy of me. Now, there is also, I think, to be presumed here, isn't there not, that that burden, that cross, the way he says, who bears not his cross, that that may be very different for Bob Shelton over here than it is for Wells and Hohertz. I was thinking it was something specifically in, in relation to work, which I'll be taking off for the holidays and so forth. And it always it, it's uh, the boss would be much happier if I work on holidays. Oh, yeah. I work on Sabbath day. You know, I, I, we're real busy, you know, and uh, uh, I could work uh, since last since feast. I guess over half times on Saturday. I've been working the shop, you know. Yeah. And it's a sticky one. It's an uncomfortable thing. And he he rips about it now and then. Yeah, he's very nice. We have a good relationship, but uh, he'd be he'd be happy if I work on Sabbath day and work on holidays. Oh yeah. It's kind of a it's a, a friction. Yeah. Uh, Thank Doesn't mind you taking the time off. He's just ready to be there those days. <laughs> but, but the point is, though, that what you face and what Diane might face are very different. And you are expected to pick up your cross and follow him. Now, have you ever sat down and tried to figure out what yours is? I mean, I have no idea. For me to start trying to define crosses that people have to bear would be an exercise in futility. Uh, I can I can sit down and spend some time and think mine out. I don't know I doubt if I could help you much with yours. Have you ever done that? It's an important exercise for you, Bob. Well, would it, wouldn't it basically mean that you, it, you're just supposed to deal with the, the adversity that come your way as they come your way? you got to pick it up. Yeah, well, see, you know, it's not merely a matter in many cases of, of walking around it, you know, or walking away from it. You're supposed to pick it up and carry it. And the analogy is, you know, Jesus was compelled to bear his cross. He was walking up the way, you know, and, 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 and they said, okay, here he is. You carry it. And he picked it up and put it on his shoulders and he lugged it down the, the thing until he finally fell. And even that, you, you kind of figure, must be symbolic because they then compelled another man to pick that up, Simon of Cyrene, and carry it right alongside with him. And there's a whole beautiful old hymn, Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone? And all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. The, old, the hymn goes beautiful hymn. And essentially, uh, the idea of facing up to, doing a little time in prayer to analyze what you're facing, what your crisis is, or what your burden is, or what your responsibility is, and thinking in terms of picking it up is time very well spent. I don't know, because yours is different from mine. There will be as many different ones as there are people, Lee. Well, is he not, it seems to me that he's telling the 12 disciples that this is what they, yeah. they should do, not, not telling them that that's the word that they should spread. Not necessarily. This particular thing. And yet, you know, th this statement, though, the, the whole statement is made to them, right? The, right? the instructions of what they're to do. But then he says, this statement beginning in verse 34 really has to do with what he's sending upon the world. Not merely upon them. Don't think I'm coming to send peace on the earth. I'm come not to send peace of the sword. He didn't say, I am come to set you at variance. He said, I am come to set a man at variance. But then in verse 37 yeah. is when he says you. Mm -hmm. And he goes back to you. And if you follow it on down. Well, actually, verse 37, he that loves, you know, and he that loves father or mother, uh, and he that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. We haven't gone to you, really, in, in, in this translation. You maybe have a different one there. Yeah. I'd have to look to see what it is in the, in the original. 
And the King James, it just it, it continues down in that, in that third person. But even if it were you, uh, they were then to teach, and according to Matthew 28, 19, 20, go, go into all the world and teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. And so that the principle underlying it is applicable. In other words, every one of us, in truth, does have a burden to bear. You know, it may be one thing, it may be another. And oftentimes, you don't sometimes really realize what that is until you hit that crisis point in your life. I know that, for example, when we baptized people over the years, I, I don't suppose we always did it, but I always tried to, in a baptism counseling, I would tell a person, now, I want you to understand something. Uh, experience has taught us that over the years that, that after baptism, it may be a week, it may be two weeks, it may be three, it may be a year, I don't know when it will be, but you will be tried you will be tested. Something is going to happen. And, it, and it's, it's very important when that time comes that you be ready for it, that you set in your mind that you're going to be obedient to God, that you're going to carry through or going to do it. Because oftentimes people are caught completely unaware. They have this feeling that I'm, I'm baptized, I come up out of the water, now God's on my side and everything ought to go my way. Wrong. You know, it really does. In fact, in some cases... It is almost as though you make this agreement with God when you go into the waters of baptism that I'm giving my life to you. God says, okay, you said that. Now I'm going to test you on it. I want to see if you meant what you said. And that trial, uh, you know, and it's, it's really surprising how consistent it is. And like I say, it may be three weeks or a month. And even then, who knows, maybe we're all facing things three months or three weeks to a month or two months apart and just not that aware of them. It's that contrast between now, something's different in my life when I face this problem than it has been when I faced a problem before. But it's something worth giving some thought to. Now this whole passage, as I said, is pointed at them. But a man would be very short-sighted if he did not consider how it's going to apply to everyone who takes in hand to follow Jesus Christ wherever it is he's going to go. To them, he says, he that receives you, verse 40, receives me. He that receives me, he has definitely transferred back to the you here. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. In verse 42, whosoever shall give a, a, a drink unto one of these little ones, a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Any other questions on this, uh, this passage? Might those rewards be? Ah. Peter asked that. He said, you know, we've left everything and followed you. What are we going to have? And he said, well, there is no one who has left houses or lands or, or brothers or sisters who shall not receive a hundredfold in this life and eternal life in the world to come. Interesting. And you wonder yourself, where is it? When, when am I getting mine? <laughs> you know, because so many times we don't feel that way. Yeah, pardon? He also added persecutions. Yeah, I added persecutions. So, uh, you know, that's an interesting one to think about. Give some thought to. The, the question is, are you going to receive a hundredfold in kind? But anyway, that's another subject. I won't, don't want to turn this into a class on philosophy. <laughs> Matthew 11, and verses 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knows any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. I mean, that knowledge, you're not going to know God except by knowing him through the Son. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, I'm not sorry, upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It doesn't seem that way sometimes. And yet, compared, perhaps comparatively speaking, to what could be, or what the world might have for you, maybe indeed it is. But that's his promise. Come to me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light is light. Matthew 13, this is one of the most startling, it was to me one of the most startling scriptures in the New Testament when I first realized what it was saying. 
this is the parable of the sower and the seed. And you have a situation here where it says, There were multitudes, and he spoke many things to fit them in parables, verse 3, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns. The thorns sprung up and choked them. The other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And I, I'll tell you, I can remember this like it was yesterday. It's one of those funny things. And this goes way, way back to when I was, I don't know, I might have been nine or ten at the time, when I was in Sunday school up in Harrison, Arkansas. And the teacher was talking to us about parables. She said, now Jesus spoke in parables in order to make his meaning clear. <laughs> I thought that makes sense. You know, I mean, as, and, and, I, and over the years, I kind of assumed that that was the case because... When I got up as a speaker later in life to speak, I would use an illustration or an explanation or a little story in order to make my meaning clear. The last thing in the world I would want to do in speech class was to make my meaning obscure. I'd get a bad grade, right? So, it, you know, it never occurred to me until one day somebody said, pointed out what he answered. He, they said, ask him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it is not given. And then is when I came to understand the word parable is not illustration. That's not the best translation. It's not explanation. It's not story. The best translation is riddle. These are riddles. They are things which have a great deal of meaning, but the meaning is coded. Why? Because it is given to you. We can divide this room down the middle here. We can say, it's given to you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. To them, these people over here, it's not given. And Jesus could speak to a crowd of people and have some of them understand what he was saying and some of them not. And it seems to have been, it is, would you say that that is his, they said, why do you do this? He said, so they wouldn't understand. Whosoever has, to him shall be given, he shall have more abundance. Whoever has not, from him shall be taken away, even what he has. This is a long way from communism, and of course it isn't just talking about economics, it's talking about truth, understanding, wisdom. People that have will get more. People that don't have are going to lose what they've got. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see and don't see. Hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, seeing you shall see and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Now what do you do with that? Now does that say to you that Jesus Christ shut the door on some people? It does. Now, we could talk all day about why, and maybe it's their fault, and, and they were in a state of unbelief. But now, we also ran across in our readings another interesting scripture. Jesus, talking about Capernaum, I think, and a couple of other cities where he had done a lot of mighty works, said, It will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for you. Now, you know about Sodom and Gomorrah, don't you? This was a town of, both of them, a town of incredible wickedness. These towns were so bad that God came down himself, and when he saw how wicked they were, he burnt them, both incinerated them. It was like some giant prehistoric nuclear explosion. Burnt them to a crisp. And he says, in the judgment, they will have more tolerance than you. Now, hell's hell, isn't it? You get thrown into hell, you're in hell. And you're jumping around from one hot brick to the other, and you're tormented forevermore. I mean, what, what tolerance? What are we talking about tolerance? Does this mean I get a cooler room? Uh, you know, I've heard all these stories and jokes about you know all the gradations of hell and all the things that go on in hell, but hell's hell, folks. I mean, there's no... 
uh, fooling around with it. Lake of fire is the lake of fire. How do we find tolerance? Well, the understanding of that is in the understanding of a period of time in which God is going to raise all men up and all men are going to be judged and all men are going to have a chance at salvation, even those who had never had a chance before in this life and had never understood. And people like Capernaum, where Jesus had walked in their streets, had healed the sick, himself had come to them, are going to be in better shape than a city that never knew the difference. That's what he's saying when that time comes. Questions before we, uh, to stop tonight? Yes, sir. Well, I had always considered that uh, the reason it'd be more tolerance for Sodom and Gomorrah because they had never heard the truth. Exactly. But the others had. Exactly. That's the reason they were. That's the reason. But that, that, you see, this is a, there's a problem buried in that for certain kinds of theology. The theology that has to do with the immortal soul that man lives his life out now and with the end of his life goes either to heaven or to hell has got a lot of problem with that if they think it through. Right? A lot of problem with it. This is why we, we raise this question. How do you find tolerance in the day of judgment when you went to heaven or hell when you died? See, this is, uh, this is what we're up against. It's a lot more complex than heaven or hell when you die. Isn't that judgment the, the great... Uh, the great white throne judgment. judgment? That's right. Any other questions? Yes. That's where the Catholics have the answer. I'm sorry? That's where the Catholics have the answer. Yeah. Of course, they once, once you adopt the, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, then heaven, hell, and purgatory becomes, the purgatory or limbus patrum and limbus and father become absolutely logically essential. And they are logically inescapable when you accept the immortality of the soul. But that's another subject.